Hello, um, I have a playlist for my students on climate change, um, but uh, like any uh, field in science, uh, I try to update it from time to time. And here in 2020, I think there's not only the need to update it, but also uh, take another perspective because obviously during uh, 2020, coronavirus um, received an enorm enormous amount of uh, attention and rightly so. And perhaps among the lessons we learned from uh, coronavirus uh, were one, uh, when we ignore science and when we don't uh, heed uh, uh, experts and instead when we let you know disinformation uh, flood uh, you know our um, our social media and uh, when uh, we make poor decisions based on disinformation that there is a cost there is an economic uh, cost which can be huge um, there is a health cost which can be huge and if we don't forget these lessons once 2020 passes, I think these lessons will then serve us well uh, as we address uh, the next uh, crisis which we are facing uh, on uh, climate change. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, video is not going to uh, recap every aspect of climate change because I try to do that um, in other videos. Instead, just kind of um, do a quick update on 2019 and uh, 2020. Um, and so uh, are things better than uh, they were? Uh, now that we were all focused on coronavirus. Um, no, uh, the climate uh, crisis is uh, worsening. And obviously there's a reason for that because there are gases which trap heat in the atmosphere. And every year we continue to produce enormous numbers of them. So for example, carbon dioxide. Um, as we dig up fossil fuels where carbon was buried for hundreds of millions of years and we burn it and we put it into the air, this then results in millions of metric tons of um, of carbon into uh, the atmosphere. Now, there are other things that play a part as well. So for example, when we burn forests with deforestation, that's less carbon being taken out of the air. But here you can see the problem is obviously not solving itself given the number of millions of metric tons uh, that are continued to be uh, produced. Uh, as you can uh, see, some countries produce more than uh, others. So the top four uh, would be Russia, India, uh, the United States uh, and China. And China's um, uh, contribution has been significantly growing. And that's a problem because uh, uh, China now represents um, more than a quarter of all uh, global uh, uh, emissions. Um, now, uh, clearly, uh, this is a, a, a concern. Um, and I'll get to per capita by a second, um, although it is constantly changing. So one of the reasons for this update. And so if you were to look at uh, some of the leading carbon emitters, there are changes over uh, time. So for example, notice that in the United States and the European Union, um, the overall emissions have been decreasing. And so uh, using a renewable uh, energy uh, sources, uh, better fuel standards, uh, appliances, which are energy star uh, efficient. Also the switch to natural gas as a major um, producer of electricity instead of coal um, has also helped uh, to, uh, in the United States, cause this drop. Uh, natural gas produces less uh, carbon uh, emissions for the same amount of uh, energy as coal does. So notice that the United States and the European Union uh, practices have been lowering emissions. That's certainly good news. Um, but in other parts of, of the world, such as India and in particularly China, um, the emissions uh, have been rising. And in China, um, uh, very um, uh, that's a very uh, steep uh, rise, as, as you can see. Uh, so here's just a, a quick I note that you can uh, see one of the reasons to you know stay on top of this is once again that things change. If you look at um, uh, the contribution of different fossil fuels, for example, uh, petroleum. Uh, the United States uses less petroleum and than it did in its uh, height. Uh, natural uh, gas, its contribution is uh, increasing, uh, while coal, uh, its contribution is uh, is uh, decreasing. Um, now, in 2020, obviously, there was the economic slowdown uh, from uh, the coronavirus affecting the economy, but this affected different fossil fuel 
uh, productions differently. Natural gas was only about down about 2% from the previous uh, year. Petroleum use down 13%, coal use down 19%. Uh, uh, percent. And so obviously there are uh, things that can cause uh, fluctuations. Uh, overall, uh, the United States is using uh, less coal, slightly less petroleum, uh, and natural gas is playing a more significant part in its uh, fossil uh, fuel uh, uh, repertoire. Now, in addition to looking at the total uh, emissions, um, one of the things that could uh, receive focus is the per capita emissions. So for example, if you were to just compare China and the United States, for example, China produces car far more carbon uh, waste than the United uh, States, uh, almost a double. But China has far more people um, living uh, in it. And if you were then to divide the total carbon emissions um, by the population, um, each person in China is producing uh, less uh, carbon uh, waste than the average person in uh, the uh, United uh, States. And then you could do that for uh, lots of uh, countries as well. Once again, India's percentage was rising, um, but uh, each person in India uh, produces uh, a much smaller amount of uh, carbon uh, waste. Now, uh, this uh, varies from country to country. Some countries like Canada would actually have per capita carbon emissions higher than the United States. Um, some of that would then be tied to just having to uh, heat houses, you know, more in uh, in colder um, in uh, colder uh, weather. Uh, and so uh, uh, that's another aspect that you could look at. Once again, you know, while the United States is certainly among the highest in per capita emissions, there are a few countries which are uh, higher, um, uh, such as um, uh, Canada, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Australia, and, uh, and others. So carbon dioxide continued to be uh, produced um, even uh, with the economic slowdown of uh, 2020. So what did that do to the uh, levels of carbon dioxide in uh, the atmosphere? Did uh, they drop? Um, well, uh, tragically, uh, uh, no. And so uh, the reason that we care is if you look at uh, the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere, this is the black line, and the carbon uh, emissions, um, this then, um, uh, they are uh, linked in that uh, the more carbon uh, we uh, put into uh, the atmosphere, the higher the levels in uh, the atmosphere. And uh, every year as we go from, uh, uh, you know, throughout recent decades, if you were to measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the air in parts per million, the level just keeps going up and up. In uh, the nine, late 1950s, when it was first uh, measured, uh, the level was 315 parts per million. Um, but notice that at no point has it gone down as the annual average. Now there is a fluctuation from year to year, so it'll it'll go up and go down, and this has to do with um, you know the changing of the seasons. But the annual average every year has gone up. So every year has now an all-time high in terms of uh, carbon dioxide in uh, the atmosphere. And by all-time high, I'm talking about recent human uh, history. We know more about the geologic past. That would be um, a, a different uh, conversation. And one of the things that we know is, you know, it's okay for the world to be warmer than uh, it is. It's okay for the world to be hotter than it is during the you know, past 500 million years, the Earth has normally been warmer than it is. So carbon dioxide going up and the Earth getting hotter, I mean, it's not, um, you know, a problem necessarily for the planet. It's the living things on the planet, like ourselves. You know, so if the temperature uh, spikes, if seas, uh, if the ice caps melt, this uh, floods much of the land, which uh, is currently dry. This will certainly affect humans, human societies. It'll affect a lot of species, which have adapted to specific ranges. So it could cause a mass extinction. So the planet is okay. 
Um, but the living things on uh, the planet, uh, when there have been uh, spikes of uh, global warming and temperature changes in the past, you know, this has often uh, provoked uh, biological crises, and we certainly don't want to be involved in that. Uh, once again, uh, if you were to measure carbon dioxide, you could do it by year, but also do it by month. And um, as you know, we see changes over an entire planet over a year, as for example, in the northern hemispheres, there's a whole lot of photosynthesis, carbon's taken out of the air, and then in autumn leaves drop, the carbon dioxide returns to the air, there's this natural um, uh, uh, fluctuation. But if you look here at 2018, all right, so we could measure, you know, January, February, um, and, uh, you know, these values are, uh, are published uh, every single month. So, you know, you can do your own uh, research uh, going to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, going to their websites. Uh, notice that every month of uh, 2019 in purple was higher than every month uh, uh, from 2018 in orange. Now, because of the economic slowdown, a valid question is, um, did we use less um, uh, uh, fossil fuels? Would this actually cause, you know, the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to slow or maybe even reverse, and even if it was just a temporary uh, reversal. I mean, that would be good, you know, bringing carbon dioxide levels down for the first time since 1950s. That would be uh, potentially significant. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. So notice here in red that uh, each month of 2020 was hotter than each month of uh, 2019. Um, so global emissions did drop. That's good by about 7%, even if it's just a temporary drop. This affected different countries differently, um, in part because the coronavirus affected some countries more seriously than others. So, for example, in the United States, where the coronavirus, you know, was you know perhaps among the worst um, uh, per capita, uh, glo our global emissions through our economic slowdown was about 12 percent uh, of a drop. Uh, the European Union about 11 percent. Uh, China a much smaller uh, drop of uh, of two percent. Um, and so that may be, if you look at the distance between the orange dots and the purple dots, that may be um, the major reason or certainly contributing to the smaller difference between the purple dots and the red dots. So while um, the emissions, uh, the carbon dioxide levels in, 29, in 2020 were in red were higher than 2020 in purple, um, the difference is not as great as it was, say, separating an orange and a purple dot. But nevertheless, in May of 2020, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere reached 417 parts per million. That is the highest it has been in, you know, uh, since records were kept in the late 1950s. And if we were to look at gas bubbles trapped in ice, we can go back further. So this is the highest in human history in uh, 20. Um, uh, at 20. And although there was a slowdown, uh, you know, the increase that we're expecting uh, overall is about on par with what the average for the past 10 years have been. So um, when you look at uh, the 1950s value of 315, 417 is 100 parts per million above that. That's a huge difference. That means, you know, about a quarter of the um, uh, uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is new essentially in my lifetime. Uh, so that's huge. And also when we look at the difference between ice age carbon dioxide levels and interglacial um, carbon dioxide levels. Now the ice age is probably involved, you know, other things as well, such as ocean currents. Um, but that was about a hundred parts per million between the climate being warmer than it is today. And because I'm in Northeast uh, Pennsylvania, um, a third of a mile of ice being on uh, the surface. Um, so uh, we worry about differences, you know, of um, uh, of uh, this uh, magnitude. Um, and carbon dioxide is obviously not the only story. Um, I discuss this more uh, elsewhere, uh, but once again, I'm just trying to give an update uh, uh, here. So if you were to say, all right, well, methane. Now, methane is not as common in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide uh, is, um, but it has a higher global warming potential. So uh, one kilogram of methane 
uh, will absorb 34 times the amount of uh, heat uh, that carbon dioxide will. So it does absorb heat. That can be measured. There's no question of, uh, of that. And once again, um, one uh, kilogram of methane has the same ability to warm the planet as 34 kilograms of, um, uh, of carbon dioxide. I had mentioned earlier that a hydraulic fracturing um, is having an economic uh, benefit. And this is another topic and I just discuss it in greater detail later, but it is contributing to a decreased emissions as coal was replaced with natural uh, uh, gas. Um, one sidebar is we may not be accurately measuring all of the methane released from hydraulic uh, uh, fracturing. Um, because in some cases, you know, it depends on state by state, uh, reporting may be voluntary. Um, um, and, uh, you know, there are, you know, different presidential administrations can roll back uh, protections on releasing uh, uh, methane. And so hydraulic fracturing uh, may have a more significant impact on uh, global uh, warming. One of the things is that may not necessarily be true of um, hydraulic fracturing period, but rather how it is practiced in, in that. So, uh, you know, in some states and certain, you know, companies could do a far better uh, job of protecting the environment and limiting methane uh, uh, release, while other uh, states and other companies uh, may uh, protect the environment less and therefore contribute far more. Um, and so if we were to look at methane uh, levels, like carbon dioxide, every year is a record year. And so while this is an update saying in 2020, you know, methane levels are higher than they've ever been since we've kept records, that's true of every year because as human activity produces more and more methane, there has um, not been, uh, there were some slowdowns in the early uh, uh, 2000s. But since 2005, every year simply goes up and up. I'm making this video at the end of 2020. Um, and so let me just, uh, because the 2020 annual value is not yet uh, available, if you were to compare uh, August of 2018 to August of uh, 2019 uh, to August of 2020, um, even with the economic slowdown because of uh, coronavirus, it certainly seems as if, uh, you know, methane, uh, the increase in methane emissions is not just that we're making, you know, uh, it would be great to cut methane emissions or at the very least hold them steady. So we're not even cutting them to the point where, you know, we're holding steady, which would still be a problem. Each year we make the problem worse than uh, the year before. Um, and there are other um, gases which contribute to climate change uh, as well, such as nitrous oxide, uh, which we get uh, from, you know, fertilizer use uh, from uh, cattle, just as, as, you know, the more cattle there are, the more methane there is. Um, one kilogram of nitrous oxide has a global warming potential of 298. Uh, so that's 298 um, kilograms of carbon dioxide would warm the planet as much as one kilogram of, uh, of nitrous oxide. So it's a more uh, potent uh, greenhouse gas. And tragically, once again, its levels just keep going up and up. Each year is a record year. So what we would ideally want is for levels to go down. Short of that, we would like levels to stay constant, which would still be a problem. But notice the problem just keeps getting worse. Not only is this an increase, that's a steep slope. That's a serious increase. Um, once again, uh, did we notice you know, that in 2020 with the slowdown because of coronavirus, that this leveled off or even went down. Um, well, we certainly didn't, at least going by the August values. Once again, the annual values aren't um, uh, available yet. There are other molecules which we release in much smaller quantities, um, but they have a much uh, larger global warming potential. Some of these are also of interest when it comes to the ozone hole and the reduction of ozone, which causes us, you know, to, uh, you know, when I was a child, you know, you didn't see all of this sunblock, you know, instead it was, you know, all of these sun tanning products, but now, you know, you go to the same, you know, stores and you see all, all of the sunblock in summer, just because our risk of skin cancer is so much higher because we've damaged the ozone 
uh, layer, many of the chemicals uh, which ozone, uh, which uh, affect the ozone um, uh, layer, uh, they can have global warming potential, uh, potentials in the thousands. Um, now, uh, once again, just part of another lecture, um, there are certain um, of the freons which were uh, banned in um, after the Montreal Protocol protocol to uh, protect the ozone layer. Um, and, and so you might say, oh, but you know, they're done, aren't they? You know, because they were, you know, a product, a stopped production in 1996. Um, well, no. And uh, so there is still uh, some productions of say Freon 11 and Freon 12. Uh, some countries, for example, China is still uh, producing this. It's recently been uh, brought to light. Um, but also these things will last a while in the atmosphere. So even if, you know, we pass treaties and cut uh, the uh, um, production of certain, uh, certain polluting um, uh, chemicals. Um, and nevertheless, they, uh, uh, they last a while. Now, these were of concern because of their ozone depletion uh, potential. Um, uh, but notice that they also have a high global warming uh, potential. Uh, these freons have been replaced with other uh, molecules uh, that damage the ozone less. So notice 0 0.06 is less than one. And um, this last one, uh, the ozone depletion potential is essentially zero. Um, but notice they still have a high global warming uh, potential. It's less than uh, freons 11 and 12. So that's an improvement. Um, but nevertheless, notice that these levels are increasing in uh, the atmosphere. And so they will uh, contribute uh, to, uh, continue to contribute to uh, global uh, warming. Um, and the same is true of sulfur hexafluoride, which is produced in, um, uh, it, uh, it's used in uh, electrical applications. Uh, it is the most potent greenhouse gas known with a warming potential of more than 23 Thousand. So one kilogram of this would be have the same warming potential as 23,000 kilograms of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, now this 23,000 value, it, it can vary depending on, you know, where you see it calculated. And here's one of the reasons, like, how do you calculate it? Because some of these will last for 800, up to 3,000 years. So do you calculate how much heat it will absorb when? Over the first 100 years, over the first 1,000? And so uh, you can see different numbers that are just measuring it slightly uh, differently. Uh, and so this is you know, dangerous as far as um, our, uh, our climate is concerned. You know, this molecule, although you know, we produce very little of it, so here you see in parts per trillion. Um, nevertheless, it has such an enormous global warming potential that it's a concern. And notice, every year is a record year. So we are not decreasing production of this. We are not even leveling off and stabilizing. Each year we're increasing. And if you notice the slope of this line, this is a pretty steep slope, All right. So this is a uh, problem. And once again, the economic slowdown of 2020 uh, did not seem to seriously um, to impact this. So uh, one of the uh, parts of this update is if we were to ask, um, uh, you know, in uh, in 2020, are we cutting emissions of uh, of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere? Um, and the answer is no. Now, some countries are making progress. The United States is cutting its, you know, per capita emissions. Um, but overall, uh, in uh, the world, uh, we are not even stabilizing. We continue to make. So, if we just produced, say, heat trapping gases at 20, you know, at 2010 levels, that would continue to make the planet warmer. Um, but we don't even go back to 2020, you know, 10 level. You know, we're just making the planet warmer or making more and more of these heat trapping gases. Can we see an effect? Well, as I've discussed uh, elsewhere, um, yes. So if you were to say, pick this baseline, this black line is the average temperature of the 20th century from 1900 to the year 2000. At the beginning of the century, uh, the average temperatures were all cooler than that. But notice what's happening towards the end of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the century and into you know, uh, uh, 2020. Um, the temperature just keeps getting higher. So global temperature has uh, continued to gone up so that we are reaching record temperatures in um, 
human experience. Once again, the dinosaurs had warmer temperatures than this, um, but then the dinosaurs didn't have Arctic ice and Florida was underwater mostly. Um, and so once again, we could go back there, we would just prefer not to. Uh, and so uh, these are the warmest temperatures which we have, uh, have experienced. All of the hottest years have occurred since uh, 1998. Uh, um, and um, there are years where we take, we reach record temperatures. So 2014 was the hottest year on record as of 2014, but that was beat the next year and then beat the next year. 2016 currently holds the record for the warmest um, year uh, ever. Um, but last year, 2019, was the second hottest year on record. So 2016 was the hottest, 2019 was the second uh, hottest. And if you were to list the nine hottest years, 2016, 2019, 15, 17, 18, 14, 10, 13, and uh, five, they've all occurred in the last two decades. That would be the nine hottest years. The six hottest years have occurred in the last six years. So every one of the last six years has been among the six hottest years on uh, record. Now, how will 2020 uh, rank in uh, this? Uh, well, once again, I'm making this you know, uh, just before the annual values will uh, become available for uh, a class. And so I don't quite have the, um, the value for 2020, but uh, records are kept on a monthly basis as well. And so you could see that uh, October 2020 was the fourth hottest October in record. Uh, the months of June, September, and November were the third hottest of their respective months on record. Uh, many of the months of 2020 were the second hottest months uh, uh, respectively on record. And January and May were the absolute hottest months of January and May uh, on a record. Um, so uh, it seems as if 2020 will be ranked in the top three hottest uh, years. So the trend is, uh, is clear uh, that uh, these heat trapping gases, which we continue to put in the, um, uh, the air, are trapping uh, gases and the earth is getting hotter. Now, once again, I, I mentioned this, you know, uh, briefly. Um, these are records which are free and available and kept uh, monthly. And so you can do your own, um, you can do your own study. I, uh, I mentioned uh, in the introduction uh, that, you know, with the disinformation, which tragically uh, is becoming more and more uh, rampant, um, seeking out good or reputable scientific sources, actually analyzing data instead of uninformed opinions. This is something that, you know, critical, critically thinking students uh, should make themselves aware of. And so there are um, online um, scientific journals like the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that you can get for free, all right, and read, you know, the, uh, the experts who are actually measuring this or go to um, the National Oceanic an atmospheric uh, administration and, and measure uh, those. So I just kind of, you know, made my little uh, animation based on uh, their data going uh, through month um, uh, by month. So, but you certainly don't uh, need to take, you know, my word for it or, you know, someone's uh, word for it, you know, on Facebook or on Twitter or anything. You can actually uh, do uh, uh, the research uh, yourself and study this uh, yourself. Now, continuing with um, the uh, update, if the planet is getting uh, warmer, well, then what does that mean uh, for uh, ice? Well, ice continues to, uh, to shrink. Now, there's you know, uh, ice in different parts of, um, uh, of uh, the world. Um, but if you were to go, and once again, records are... Um, uh, are kept uh, monthly. So you could say, all right, August 2020, um, how much ice is there in the Arctic? That's here in uh, uh, white. Um, how does that compare? And you would say, oh, that's the third least ice extent since the ice mass was measured in 42 years. So it's smaller than it was in 1980. That's the aqua uh, area. It's smaller than um, uh, the uh, average uh, here in uh, uh, in pink, right? And so um, 
you know, the levels, uh, so the, the pink is the median uh, from uh, 1981 uh, to 2000 and, uh, and 10. And so ice uh, continues to shrink and you can actually study this um, month by uh, month. Uh, if you were to take September, and it is September when the Arctic ice uh, extent gets to uh, the smallest uh, in that year, the September ice extent was 2.4 million square um, uh, kilometers. Now, notice that the aqua area, September 1980, Arctic ice covered 7.7 .7 million square kilometers. Um, September 2020, um, uh, 3.9. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, I was talking too uh, quickly and I advanced a little bit. So September uh, 2020 was 3.9 million square uh, kilometers. That's here in uh, white. That is significant um, because in 42 years of measuring Arctic ice, when has Arctic ice covered less area than in September 2020? Only in September 2012. All right. So this is the second least ice extent. Um, uh, that has been uh, ever uh, observed. Um, and so that is certainly significant. And if you were to take the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the difference uh, of uh, the, uh, uh, the ice uh, extent, uh, the square miles are significant. This would uh, then uh, cover um, about half of the contiguous uh, United States. So once again, you know, how significant is this ice loss? We'll look at the continents. Once again, the difference between uh, the blue uh, area and the white area uh, would once again cover uh, half of the contiguous uh, United States. That is certainly significant. That's a huge area of white ice which is missing. So white ice reflects light back into the atmosphere. The blue ocean which uh, replaces it absorbs heat. So not only is our planet warming, but it will now start to warm faster as a result. October 2020 recorded the least ice extent in uh, the month of October uh, with 2019 holding the previous uh, record. And the difference um, between uh, October 2020 and the uh, median, uh, the pink area, was the greatest uh, difference uh, observed in any uh, month. So Arctic ice is certainly um, continuing to uh, decrease, as is Greenland's ice. So Greenland's melt uh, continues. Uh, last year, 20, uh, 2019, um, was the worst year of uh, Greenland's ice uh, melt. Um, luckily in 2020, uh, the ice loss is uh, significant, um, uh, uh, but it is less severe than um, uh, in, uh, in recent years. So uh, 2020 is worse than any year prior to uh, 2002, um, but because 2019 was so, uh, uh, was so bad, uh, that 2020, uh, gratefully, is not uh, as bad as 2019 uh, was. So if you were to rank the years of Greenland's uh, melt, notice that they've all been uh, recent. And once again, luckily, 2020 is a little uh, more uh, mild, uh, et cetera. 2019, um, there was almost double uh, the annual uh, loss. So if you were to take 2002 to 2016, uh, Greenland loses 269 uh, gigatons of ice. In 2019, it was almost double that. Uh, and so um, uh, clearly, uh, Greenland's ice is, is continuing uh, to melt. Now, uh, this can impact you know, lots of people in different uh, ways. Obviously, not everyone is impacted by Greenland or the Arctic uh, ice. Um, uh, but as I'll mention, uh, cert uh, certainly as climate change worsens, we will see more and more events of extreme uh, weather. And clearly extreme weather uh, can uh, uh, affect us. I'll mention uh, hurricanes and climate change uh, and wildfires in a second. But in addition to those which might um, make headlines in uh, the United States, um, uh, there is extreme uh, uh, weather 
uh, causing huge economic uh, impacts, causing lots of loss of life throughout the world. So once again, uh, just you know, a quick uh, view. Um, in Death Valley in August uh, of 2020, a reading of 130 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 54.4 degrees Celsius was gotten. Um, that is the hottest reliable temperature reading in history. There have been a couple of things, you know, going back earlier that says, oh, it reached this temperature, but you know, our, our confidence in those numbers is not quite as high. So 2020 had a moment in Death Valley in the United States where there was 0.1 planet Earth, which was hotter than any other point in uh, recorded history. Um, obviously, extreme weather events can take other forms, such as heavy rains and severe flooding, which cause you know, hundreds of, uh, of deaths in Africa and thousands of deaths in Southern uh, Asia. Um, uh, one of the, uh, the cyclones uh, was the costliest cyclone uh, in the Northern Indian uh, Ocean. Uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand uh, had uh, severe uh, wildfires from 2019, which continued. Uh, South America had severe uh, drought and record-breaking uh, uh, heat. And as I uh, mentioned uh, at kind of at the beginning uh, there, um, if one was following uh, extreme weather events in the United States, one of the things that you would have been struck by uh, was the 2020 hurricane season. In terms of numbers of hurricanes, it was the most active on record. There were more tropical uh, storms and hurricanes in 2020 than in any other uh, year. Now I'll just, uh, so here I have an animation which goes through it more slowly, the orange are tropical storms, the red hurricanes, the um, uh, uh, purple are uh, uh, major hurricanes. Um, but not only did 2020 have the uh, most, um, uh, the most uh, uh, storms, it had uh, the second uh, highest number of, uh, of hurricanes and double the average number of uh, major hurricanes. Uh, in the past uh, 26 years, 18 of those years have been above uh, average, and all five of the past uh, five hurricane seasons have been uh, above average. And so climate change um, will uh, cause an increase in the frequency of severe weather. And, you know, 2020 with the most tropical storms and hurricanes ever is a, a testament to that. Uh, 2020 was one of the worst uh, wildfire seasons on record. And so, as you can see, if you look at uh, millions of acres burns, you know, there was certainly an increase. 2020 was um, one of the top uh, three worst uh, seasons in history. Um, but in some states, it was the absolute uh, worst. Uh, and once again, we could measure you know, severity in acres burned, in economic damage, in lives lost. Uh, but in 2020, um, fires included five of the six largest wildfires in the history of California and three of the four uh, largest uh, wildfires in uh, the state of uh, Colorado. Overall, the number of uh, wildfires that we're seeing is an eightfold increase over um, the 1980s. This is, you know, because temperatures are hotter. It's because climate change changes rainfall patterns and areas uh, undergo prolonged drought. And then if the winters are less severe, then insect pests like the mountain pine beetle uh, can now plague more trees, killing more uh, trees, which means that there's more dead wood, uh, which uh, makes uh, wildfire uh, more, uh, more of a threat. And so once again, this video was meant to just update previous videos, you know, because, you know, a student might think, hey, you know, all of those previous videos on climate change, you know, if they were a couple years old, you know, in 2019 and 2020, are things better? Have things improved? Um, the answer is no, they have gotten worse. Uh, and this includes so many aspects. The last one I'll, I'll mention here is the amount of um, acid in uh, the ocean. Um, and so, uh, as more and more carbon dioxide occurs in the air, uh, there's more and more carbonic acid in uh, the ocean, and uh, thus the ocean's pH is steadily uh, dropping. Now, not only is this uh, significant uh, because it 
uh, affects organisms that have specific pH tolerance. So they'll only live in you know, certain areas. It also affects those which uh, uh, then take carbonate, uh, carbonate ions out of the ocean water to make shells around themselves, like the casings of coral or uh, the uh, shells of mussels, uh, et cetera. And somewhere here, I provided a list of all of the uh, organisms uh, which do that. Um, these include things like corals, shell-making animals, um, but also uh, things um, uh, in the, the plankton, like foraminiferans. Uh, and so a lot of the food chains of the ocean, depending on uh, corals for homes or those uh, planktonic uh, elements uh, for food, etc., depend on organisms uh, which are uh, incorporating uh, calcium carbonate. And as uh, the ocean becomes more acidic, that chemistry just doesn't work. So, you know, these shells are getting thinner, et cetera, because instead of now carbonate, there's bicarbonate because there's more hydrogen ions and that's less carbonate for these organisms to observe. So we can see that as carbon dioxide levels go up, as uh, this causes carbon dioxide in the ocean to go up, and this then causes the pH of the ocean to go down as, um, uh, as uh, more and more carbonic acid is in, uh, uh, is in uh, the ocean. So uh, clearly that is a, a problem. So I'd like to end this update kind of just where I uh, began. Uh, if, you know, 2020 has taught us lessons, hopefully one of those lessons is we ignore science at our peril. Um, disinformation has a real price. If people are ignorant uh, or misinformed about how the natural world works, poor decisions are made. And these poor decisions can have huge economic costs and have huge costs in, uh, uh, in uh, regards of the loss of life. So coronavirus and our response uh, to it, a large part of that has been determined. But the next crisis is that of climate change. And if we take a lesson out of uh, 2020, hopefully it is that uh, only by you know, getting accurate information, using critical thinking, avoiding misinformation, can we make the best decisions to limit the economic uh, and human toll of, of crises.